So this is the behind the scenes. Hopefully it actually works. Let's see. So prepare to go live. Let's see. This is where stream URL. So it should. <clears throat> Streaming on Twitter, streaming on, so I think we're, look at that, we are live. Well, you want to start a minute early or should we just uh, do a little bit more of the um, patter? I think, give, give me one minute, I'm going to try and think where I can. It's better with the AirPods. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if it's tapping into LinkedIn stream key. Let's see. Make sure I'm doing it properly. Skip that. LinkedIn's, LinkedIn is so squirrely. I, I see myself on LinkedIn. Do you? Are we actually moving and talking? Yeah. Oh, cool. I love it when it works. This stream, this live stream is already better than the last LinkedIn live stream where we were live everywhere but LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, there it is. Look at that. All right. Well, should we start talking and be live? Uh, Jason Rogers. Hello, oh, my friend. How has your week been? You know, it's been a little bit of a strange week, but I can't complain too much. We're here. It's Friday. We're chatting. Um, you know, and we're two hours away from a, a beer or maybe one, depending on your, <laughs> depending on when you call it on a Friday. Yeah. I think you and I, you and I are in the same time zone, right? You're, you're hailing from down there in the down, down South. Yeah. yeah. PT, PT or PST or PDT. I'm never, I'm never really sure, but yeah. Well, uh, if anyone, anyone tunes in live on the East coast, they're, they're cooler and better. Cause I think it's, it's later over there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to try a Negroni this weekend. We're doing a, a camping trip with some friends and I was researching and everyone says that's the, the staple cocktail that, uh, love a Negroni. Yeah. you, you got to have under your belt. So yeah, got to pick up like the sweet vermouth because, you know, the, to have like an actually stocked, you know, bar takes a little bit of effort to actually have all the things to to go to. Yeah, it does. It does. I really like a view curry, which is like a whiskey cocktail, but you need absinthe to like coat the glass. Mm. And I'm always like, oh, I forgot the. It's <laughs> How like many times are you going to use? Yeah, you always end up with some random additional cocktail mixings that you would never otherwise use. Totally. 100%. All right. Well, some of the people who will tune in know who I am. Some of the people know who you are, maybe don't know me. You want to just give your, you know, I, I spelled it out a little bit in the background, you know, talking about, you know, I was inspired to fire this up based upon your sub stack, you uh, newsletter post, you created about the praise go goblin. You want to tell me like your, why don't you frame up your background and how, because I think that plays into that post and, and where it came from and just kind of your thinking. Yeah, sure. So I'm Jason Rogers. Um, you know, currently I'm a, a writer. Um, I do a lot of editorial work for various publications, mostly um, at Men's Health Magazine. Um, and also actually have a background in brand strategy, brand consulting. So kind of do fun cultural projects there as well on a freelance basis. Um, but uh, my, my sort of long history is that I uh, spent many years in the sport of fencing and was blessed to go to two Olympic games, uh, 2004, 2008, uh, in 2008, me and three other guys, uh, won a team silver medal, um, which was pretty cool. Um, and it's formed a lot of my life experience, uh, my sports background and things happening during that period are often the subject of a lot of the work that I do. Um, 
and it's led to just kind of a deeper interest in masculinity and culture. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, hopefully a decent segue into the piece that I think we'll ultimately talk about. Yeah, I think you and I crossed paths because our Venn diagrams overlap in a few different spaces, namely branding, which is the space I come from, both consumer and, and B2B. Um, and then just, you know, positive masculinity, sort of exploring kind of the new generation of what does it look like to be a good man, be a good ally. Um, you know, I have two boys, so raising young men in this cultural moment, in this age, um, some of the stuff you're putting out there um, in your articles, yeah, Men's Health New York Times really resonated with me. Um, and I'm a member of your book club that we spun up, sort of diving into some interesting conversations. So that's been that's been really great. Um, and specifically, you know, looking at performance and just from the different realms, you know, your background in, you know, high caliber, you know, the realm of high caliber athletics. Um, and then where I'm sort of finding myself like early stage venture capital, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of ego and just a lot of affirmation. It, it plays an interesting role in both of those spaces. So in looking at that, that was where I read your article on the praise goblin and how early on, you know, as a developing, you know, man and athlete, um, looking at the affirmations of the world and how just those intersected with your identity and how you felt and how it steered your actions was really, I was like, oh, wow, that's, it's different. I saw some differences and some similarities. So that's, so that's where I was like, I want to jump into that and unpack it with him. Cause you, you unpack some really interesting stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So do you want, maybe, maybe that's a good segue to tell me about what you characterize as the praise goblin, the role it played in your life and sort of how you've navigated thinking about that, that concept. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, the praise goblin, I guess it's just kind of like a meant to be a, a humorous stand in um, for, you know, a, a, an internal force within me that has been around since as long as I can remember. But um, I was always a really well-behaved kid. Um, you know, I'm only child, didn't like to get in trouble um, and got a lot of my energy through my achievements, even from an early age. And so when I, for example, when I started fencing, which was pretty early on in my life, about 10, 11 years old and started competing and mm -hmm. doing well, like the energy that I got from winning a medal or a trophy really kind of fed my I guess this sort of cycle of reinvesting my energy back in something because I know I can get more praise and that in and of itself isn't unique. We all have those kinds of positive feedback loops or negative feedback loops. But I wrote this piece because over time I became started to become more suspicious. And even today, I'm very suspicious of my own motivations uh, because sometimes I think I am too eager to do something for an audience or do something for claps or for plaudits um, or recognition when it should be more, I guess, internally motivated rather than externally motivated. Um, and something I reckon with, I have to really check myself sometimes, um, especially as someone who creates content and puts it out in the world, you know, hopefully for as broad a distribution as possible because you're always kind of, in this potential zone where um, you can lose sight of why you're doing something if there's a if there's a reward that's really valuable to you on the other side. Yeah, that underlying heartbeat of just the social media age and having that constant in the back of your mind or maybe in the forefront of your mind is, you know, is this, what is the reception? Sort of that, you know, that constant editor of, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that or just sort of evaluating yourself on, on performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting. In reading your piece, it struck me in a really interesting way because I was – sort of, I'm, I'm finding that I'm coming to it later in life. Like I care, I think I care more about validation in the realm of business, the more I become an entrepreneur um, and the more I spend time in venture spaces. Um, didn't care about it much back when I was, when I was coming up. 
But, and I think it's common in talking with founders who you have to read the tea leaves a little bit. It's this weird dynamic of founding a company, a venture where you have to be so confident because oftentimes you're so far ahead of the market that what you're doing is revolutionary and you may just have to naturally be confident enough and have that just sheer willpower to say, the market may not be there yet. The world may not be there yet, but you know, in five years, this thing will be huge. Or if I stick with it, um, so it can be a driver if if you allow it to be. But you know, it, it it's weird. It's in that tension of how much how much validation do you do you take versus you know being just that sheer confidence. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, clearly you, you took it to a level where it saw you to Olympic level competition. So, I mean, there was clearly some benefit there in what it enabled you to achieve in your life. Absolutely. I mean, I think any motivational vector, because this is just one of, uh, you know, a myriad, like, for example, people are motivated by financial compensation or, mon- you know, sort of a monetary uh, material, you know, vector. And then there are others that are motivated to challenge the status quo. You know, they get a lot of energy from, you know, rebelling. And then later in life, often it's um, not rebelling in a teenage sense, but um, fixing things or going against things that don't really make sort of conventional sense. Um, And so, you know, any of those is, can be really helpful if directed towards, an objective, if you know you have awareness of kind of how that works within you, how that plays a role in your own internal system. Um, and by the way, I think a lot of startup, you know, sort of like maybe venture too, but certainly people that are like trying to bring new ideas into the world have a lot of that kind of challenge, the status quo kind of energy. Um, but I do, yeah, I, I, I do think that like you just have to, you have to kind of just understand the role it's playing because it can quickly go from a positive motivating force to something that's distorting your ability to see why you're making certain kinds of decisions. Um, for yeah. example, you know, in my, in my case, you know, a lot of my um, fencing kind of motivation started out as this kind of um you know, seeking praise, seeking awards, seeking affirmation for my own kind of like climbing the ladder of success there. And then later in my career, because I was struggling with some personal anxieties and felt really insecure about myself and like I wasn't good enough, I began to to replace the energy that I would get interacting normally in my life with, you know, more and more and more of these accolades. And I think that's where you start to get into a, a cycle where, one, you're not getting the energy back that you think you're going to get, and it, you start to get really exhausted and tired. And and then two, you you become that's why this is where it becomes the goblin. You know, it's like yeah. ravenous. It's it's it only wants more and more and more, and you can never really be satisfied. And that's a pretty yeah. bad. Which you see in in any addiction cycle, you know, I mean, you need right. more of whatever your your drug of choice is to get that same level of of high of of whatever. So, yeah, like anything else, I'm sure you would need bigger trophies, more awards, more plaudits because you're on that, you know, hedonic treadmill or whatever of, oh, my gosh, right. it always like it just always has to be something bigger, bigger and better. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now you. That's, that's really interesting. You've been, yeah, it's what struck me was your ability to be vulnerable in the process. And you've, you've written and talked very openly about just your process and in processing, processing it, it's always hardest to go first. Right. And that's what I appreciate about you being willing to write about it for, I mean, big (laughs) publications like men's health and and New York times and being willing to go first um, and be a little bit vulnerable that's always been yeah i've always always admired that because i think that's it takes people with that willingness to you know open up and and advance Thanks. the conversation yeah 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 thank you and i mean you know generally speaking that's um that's always been it's always hard it's scary you never know how people are going to react you know even if you're sharing something that you've told people personally having 
having something go out on a big platform where it's 10, not just thousands, it's like tens of thousands of people that are engaging with it. Um, yeah. th that's always a scary feeling. Um, but, you know, to your point, like there, some of the motivation is always like, how can I, how, how is this going to help somebody that, you know, maybe needs this or often I think about like writing to my teenage self. And I know that's a strategy that many, writers also use, but it's mm -hmm. what's the article that if I would have read this at 16 or 17 or 18, I would have, I would have felt so much less alone. Um, the flip side to that. And again, it's just to, to dovetail this back into this notion of the goblin is like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you start to wonder like, Hmm, I know this article is going to be read by tens of thousands of people. And it's like, or maybe yeah. more. And you're, and that's where you start to, that's where you can, you know, like the, if you remember the scene from Lord of the Ring where uh, I think it's Sam, you know, Frodo's companion, like kind of quickly turns into a little bit of a Gollumish um, character because he's, you know, he's so close to the ring of power. And like, yeah. that's, you have to make sure that you're aware of those moments when you have that kind of access to uh, platforms that can potentially feed that, you know, that hunger that you have for a certain kind of praise. Yeah. That being able to have that objective looking over your shoulder and know yourself well enough to say, okay, is this, is this helpful? Is this harmful? Is this appropriate? Um, yeah, that's, that's a really, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's the, that's the trick and what you get, um, that's what you get as a writer too, being able to give voice to that and sort of in, in experiencing it first being able to share. Um, I was going back through your archives and I read your, you had a really interesting, um, it was from early 2021, where you sat down and talked with uh, Joe Arden, the king mm -hmm. of uh, audiobook romance, um, mm -hmm. and sort of how he, you know, at being a narrator for um, books and then sort of bridging that. And he built those different personas of, because he was a reader for, you know, young adult and then, you know, moved into, you know, the, the romance sphere gave himself a different name, gave himself a different brand, which was fascinating. So he could effectively do a brand extension of his voice into mm -hmm. that space. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. And, and actually that interview was an extension of a men's health uh, profile that I did of, of Joe Arden. Um, Cause he's actually a friend of mine from high school. So he's anonymous to the world. I know him really yeah. well. Um, and it's such a wonderful, I don't know, he just such, he occupies such an interesting space in the world providing, I mean, he really, he's basically sort of a, a, a vessel for intimacy, you know, reading mm -hmm. these stories and kind of reenacting these romantic encounters between people uh, in yeah. romance novels. It takes a really, uh, I don't know, he's a, he's a wonderful person. He's a wonderful actor. I, I was blessed to work on that project with him. Yeah, you went on this whole. Uh, you've been in the romance books for for men's space too. I was driving. I can't remember where I was driving about a month ago, and I, I was listening to NPR, and like your voice popped up, and you were yeah. you were getting interviewed about um, some of the because you you had like a, a men's men's romance book club or something like that. You spun up, correct? Yeah, another men's health piece that I did. I wrote about um, basically my first introduction to romance the romance genre, which is a, you know, uh, archetypally female place. Um, and I read a book called the Bromance Book Club, which is about a group of male professional athletes that read romance novels secretly and talk about them as a group to, to improve their relationships. And I thought it was, I was like, this must have been inspired by a real life thing. Hmm. And I reached out to the publisher and, and found out that it wasn't. And I was like, hey, like, this should be a thing in the world. So yeah. I wrote about starting, you know, as far as we knew, the first ever romance book club for men, um, got a bunch of friends together. And then we kind of like, you know, entered this foreign space and used it, used the, the content as a bridge to talk about really intimate stuff, which was basically our relationships and the things we struggle with, with our partners and, um, it was cool. It was, um, it was a really fun experience. We kept it going. We're on hiatus right now just because some guys are traveling. Um, yeah. Summer's hard. Summer's always hard. Um, yeah. One of us, one just got engaged. 
another one's engaged, going to get married soon. So we've all seen this interesting development over time of our own relationships um, and got to share some some pretty cool conversation and news with each other on that front. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, your your background is intriguing because you've you know stereotypically almost you know played. The, the extremes of the spectrum, right? I mean, you think of like pro athletes and, and you've written, I think you did um, that camp where from, from like ex NFL athletes where like you think of a hyper masculine sport, the NFL is right up there sort of exploring that. And then almost, you know, post career sort of, you know, deconstructing. Um, that's really, it's uh, people who can are able to sort of explore the breadth of the spectrum and have been in all those spaces and experienced all those different, different realms. Um, it gives you a deeper appreciation, I'm sure, um, of seeing just the, the diversity of just, you know, masculinity and the approaches and different ways to be, to be male, even, you know, to experience, you know, the feminine side of the masculine as well. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, I'm interested in spaces where the, conventional wisdom about how to be a man um, or cha is challenged in some way. And so, for example, the piece you're talking about is the most recent one I did where I went on a river rafting retreat with, you know, six guys that are, uh, most of them were offensive linemen in the NFL now retired. But so we're talking six foot six, literally 280, 290 pound guys um, who in, you know, in society are considered the most masculine. You know, and so your expectations of them are they're going to be super bro -y, They're going to be um, really locker room in the way they interact with each other. And the space that we ended up sharing together was a really intimate space. And we did a lot of workshops around anger and, you know, shame and sadness and all the kinds of things that you don't expect of men, let alone men of that kind of professional caliber of that kind of like the mythology of masculinity and culture. And so I guess it's my goal or in that sense, I was really interested in painting a portrait of just sort of how things can be when you don't subscribe to all these kinds of things that were already programmed to think about how men um, act, think, feel, behave. Um, and uh, I, think, I think it turned out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Is there one, is there one article or one seminal thing where you point back to and say that just the mental shift that came out of that interview or writing that piece really just, you could draw a line and say, man, before and after, or just even, even experience. I mean, honestly, my, the first published article that I did, cause I had, I had been writing before I started doing editorial work. Um, mm -hmm. like, you know, on, you know, publications, I was writing a memoir, uh, manuscript, which still, you know, is one of these things that I'm holding on to and may do something with in the future, but yeah. it's kind of how I taught myself how to write. But the first article that I wrote was a really condensed version of that story, which is basically my career in fencing alongside these kind of personal anxieties that I was dealing with, which, you know, were all related to just sort of performance anxiety in the bedroom, you know, performance anxiety around sex and intimacy, which is a really taboo topic among men. And something I had a really difficult time talking about while I was immersed in it. Um, and so putting that all together as a story and putting it out in the world was kind of like, uh, I don't use this, I want to be really careful with this phrase, you know, sort of like coming out story because it, I, I think it, it really belongs to people who are sharing other kinds of stories, you know, that yeah. are perhaps different from mine. Um, but it felt like a, an unveiling or an unwaiting, you know, because this was this thing that I kept secret for so long. And even though I'd done a lot of personal work privately and, um, you know, managed to get to a much better place mentally, physically, and my relationships as well. Uh, it was like still something that I had a lot of, you know, sort of embarrassed energy around because I, you know, something I didn't want people to know. And by sharing it with the world, that kind of, I don't know, sort of cracked things open for me. And, you know, the proof was in the pudding and, you know, my own kind of like going first and being like, hey, like if I am, all about being vulnerable. I need to like walk the walk too. And, um, yeah. 
once I did that, you know, it didn't, it got easier. It's still always hard, but it's like, you know, I can, that's kind of like the origin story or the origin experience that I returned to, um, as to like why, why I want to keep doing it. Yeah. I just keep coming back to it. It's, it's always challenging to go first and, and take that, take that first step because until someone says it, everyone thinks they're the only one, everyone thinks they're the only one who has those anxieties or, you know, is, is wrestling with that. Um, yeah. And it's, we're in such a, a better state of, of just openness. We're getting there, you know, it's society is, is continually moving and, and getting better at that and allowing more of that conversation to happen. So yeah, no, that's, that's great. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful step to get to that where you are comfortable enough. And, you know, for me, yeah, there've been those various steps where it's, you're able, I mean, I've been able to say, this is, this is it. <laughs> this is, you know, take it, take it or leave it. And it, it, it takes time to get there. Is there anything, if you, if you were going to go back and look at, um, Jason Rogers as, you know, young Jason Rogers, who's just starting off on his journey as an athlete, um, you know, and is, you know, just, you're just starting to climb the ladder, um, to go back in time and know what you know now, um, uh, is there anything you could tell your younger self, what, you know, advice, tips, you know, even if <laughs> prescient warnings of like, Hey, you may want to watch out for this thing that might, you know, be problematic down the road. Have you ever kind of thought about if you mm -hmm. could tell yourself something, what, what nugget of, of wisdom or advice you'd, you'd share? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think I had, I have two, two things to say, um, the many years of, you know, sort of life experience and thinking and processing and writing a lot of this stuff, like kind of crystallized down into two points, one for my athletic self and one for just Jason Rogers, the, you know, developing young man dealing with all the anxieties that young men deal with mm -hmm. um the, the former so my athletic self you know it's it's just this it's it's a platitude at this point but it's there's so much truth in it um you know it's focus on the process not the result and what i mean by that is like if you can just immerse yourself in in whatever it is that you're working on or doing you know, at that point in time, whether it's a certain skill or you want to, you know, strategy or whatever in sports. And again, this applies to work. I think this applies to any craft of any kind. You know, if you start thinking about how, what you want to happen as a result of little shifts and changes that you might be making, you, you pull yourself out of the present moment. You pull yourself out of, um, the spot where you start, you can, your skill and your potential actually all come together. Um, and that was always my problem. It's just not being present, not like enjoying the moment, not, you know, like, um, yeah, being, being able to just stay rooted in the skills and the things that actually like got me along the path. Mm -hmm. Um, and then personally, you know, I, I think really it's just like talk to the people you trust. Um, and just learn that discomfort is both healthy and helpful. Um, because if I would have started sharing the things that I was struggling with earlier on with my dad, who, who ultimately became a very pivotal person in my kind of turning things around and with my own personal anxieties, mm -hmm. or whether that, you know, be talking to, you know, a, a therapist and, not everyone has access to therapy, unfortunately, but, um, you know, if, if I were able to have that, uh, if I would have plugged that into my life earlier, it would have made a really big difference. Cause I think I would have not allow the things that I was struggling with to sort of coil up and become mm -hmm. a real explosive problem. Yeah. Um, so such that when you, you know, you sort of pop the cork and everything goes all over the place. Um, so yeah, it's, it would have just been trusting the people around me more to that they could hold my vulnerabilities and, you know, they don't necessarily have to have solutions, but they can provide a space for me to share them. So I feel less alone. And oftentimes they can point you to the resources that, you know, you, you might actually need to help you get through whatever you're struggling with. Yeah. There's something about 
appreciating the journey for the journey's sake that is just so transformative. And it's, yeah, I know in my life, being able to grasp that and say, um, uh, so I studied martial arts for a while right out of college because coming out of higher education, I felt like, okay, I need, I need another ladder to climb. Otherwise, you know, life is just too unstructured. <clears throat> Took a break when we had kids and came back to it recently with, with fresh eyes, you know, starting over in a different art, found a great school. And that is the one thing that, that continues to come back of there is value in the practice. You know, there's not value in, you know, it's, yes, it's great to reach that next level or in that next belt, but there's just the nature of being able to go out there and do the discipline and just appreciate the beauty in the art. Um, my dad is a, a leadership coach and, you know, entrepreneurial coach. And he has a saying that before I got into the entrepreneurial game, it always felt like a very fortune cookie type thing. But he said, leadership is learning to love the uphill. And there is something in just being able to appreciate the hard things. What do the, what do the Marines say? Embrace the suck um, to just say, yes, <laughs> this is rough, but you know, it, it is going to make me better. It's going to make me stronger. It's going to make me more, more resilient. It's not the first natural inclination and it's not the first place you go, but I found, in, you know, if, if you're able to sit with it, you know, you, you start to see the value of even those things that, you know, and sometimes it does take the value of being able to look back with hindsight and say, okay, and while I was in it, it was awful, but man, I learned some amazing lessons from that experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, it's like it's, it just goes back. I feel like there's just always, there's so much, uh, wisdom, value, practicality, and like bringing it back to what's happening right now. So the more you focus on climbing the ladder, the less you enjoy each rung that you reach because you're, you get to the next ladder to the yeah. rung and you're like, Oh, what's the next one. And, you know, so it's both, it's both a kind of piece of advice around life fulfillment and enjoyment, but it's also, it's also like a, you know, it's also a skills thing. Like you can't really get better. You can't perform well unless you're present too. So it's, you know, it's partially why, you know, mindfulness and meditation and other forms of cultivating your perceiving self and your ability to just sort of, you know, not think too much are so valuable because they impact all those domains. Um, and I will say too, that it's like, unfortunately the easiest piece of advice to give, and it's even easy to talk about, it's just really difficult to do because you, you know, your, your motor starts going, your brain motor, and you're just like, start spinning and spinning and spinning. And yeah. when someone tells you to slow down and be present, you want to punch them in the face. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Simple, not easy. <laughs> Yeah. Simple, not easy. It's uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, having, having kids for me really reinforce the power of the present. And if, you know, they are always there in the moment. And if you miss those opportunities to, you know, whatever, you know, go kick the soccer ball in the backyard, they may not be there again in, you know, in the future, you know, so it's just watching them and I mean, kids have no other space to be except right now. So it's just been, it's been such good discipline to look at that and say, okay, yeah, that's what, that's what that looks like to just be in, in the moment. Yeah, man. Yeah. And I'm, to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm super nervous about having kids. You know, we don't, my wife and I don't have kids and some of it is, um, because I'm focusing kind of on the wrong things as a person who's like really interested in mastery of, uh, of craft, you know, I, I'm like worried about where's all the time going to go and how am I going to have the focus that I need to have. And, um, but at the same time, like one, those moments that you're talking about are so rewarding. I understand. Um, but you know, too, your whole sort of perspective changes when you have kids and other things become important to you. And I'm not suggesting that if I had kids, I wouldn't be interested in mastery, but I would be, I, I know that I would feel um, less of a sort of anxious urgency to get to some destination 
um, as fast as possible. Yeah. I imagine, do you find yourself to be, have you struggled with, with perfectionism and just, I imagine like being fencing, I mean, fencing comes down to millimeters, right? So a large Mm -hmm. chunk of your life has been, you was devoted to, yeah, placing like very small micro muscle movements to guide like a very finely, you know, tuned piece of metal to, yeah, to, to strike an opponent and score, score a point, right? Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, it's incredibly technical sport. You know, you spend, you know, thousands of hours, years, like learning how to manipulate, uh, you know, a weapon in very, very sort of nuanced kind of ways. Um, and so that's just a physical process, but the, just in general, like as you climb the ladder of, of performance in any sport or any, any craft, like, in order there's not much zone you know there's not much potential for improvement left as you start to get you know close to the ceiling and so in order to you know make that one tiny little inch forward you know you have to have a sense of kind of perfectionism built into you already that you're drawing from or you have to learn it and i think i have a bit of both and it's a double-edged sword because you know, it puts you in a, a mentality of optimizing things, which is great when you're, when, when it comes to like noticing the little differences in doing things one way versus another. It's not yeah. so great when you apply that as a blanket approach to your entire life, because you just, there isn't enough energy. It's easy to become frustrated when mm-hmm. things that don't matter don't go well. For example, like I spend a lot of time surfing now and I've had to really check myself because I sometimes treat it as if I'm fencing and that's not why I do it. I don't do it as a professional athlete. I'm not doing it to beat anybody. There's no, there's literally nothing at stake. And yet I kind of get frustrated or self flagellate when I make a mistake or fall on a wave and Um, that old perfectionism judgment critic comes in the picture and really ruins my session often. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Ryan Holiday has a really great uh, newsletter called The Daily Dad, where he talks about uh, fatherhood from the perspective, you know, he takes the stoic perspective to it. And he has this uh, concept called junk time, where, you know, you look for these uh, approaching fatherhood, you know, you look at the way society portrays it and you have these beautiful images of these perfect moments where you're, you know, in that wide open field, you know, eating the perfect picnic lunch with your beautiful wife and your well-behaved kids. And like, oh, if you can achieve that perfect ideal, you know, and you can map that onto, I mean, that could be the perfect fencing match. It could be catching that perfectly formed you know wave in the ocean and you know you chase that so much but then he's like no there's like really time with your kids the times you'll remember are those just throwaway times where you share a laugh while you're making breakfast or just you know where it seems innocuous and small but it's just those little moments where you appreciate what's happening and you're just, you're just there and and it's not, you're not chasing some perfectly curated, you know, optimal ideal of what parenthood or fatherhood should look like. You're Mm -hmm. just there in the moment with them and you're, you're appreciating it and you're letting the appreciation of the thing just, yeah, wash over you and, and being there rather than saying, Oh, this would be better if it was that. Um, this is where our, you know, the, the branding and marketing and advertising industry does us a disservice if it's just creating this constant hunger for the perfect X. Oh, it'll be great. Life will be great when I achieve this or drive this or eat this while doing that in this location. Um, yeah. And if you can get to that, that be here now space where it's like, this is good happiness. <laughs> this is here. Like everything I've yeah, ever needed yeah. is right here in this. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I think the core mechanism in what you're describing is comparison, you know, like our, our brains are comparison engines. Mm-hmm. Just that's how we, that's how we just process reality. You yeah. know, it's like, how does what I feel compared to that? How does what I have compared to what they have? And, yeah. you know, again, it's a double-edged sword because it's like, 
comparison is, is helpful. You know, it's like, you know, I didn't get to the top of fencing without comparing how I was doing this one move to how that person was doing that move. And, you know, and, and sort of assimilating all those helpful noticed moments of, you know, this versus that, but it becomes unhelpful when to your point, you're like on Instagram and you're like looking at this, you know, someone's high, highlight reel of achievements or their family moments. And you're like, Oh, but my moments aren't like their moments. So they're not good enough. And that takes you out of the present and it takes you out of the enjoyment um, because the, you can't switch that engine off. You can't switch yeah. that engine off. Yeah. 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 No. So good. So good. Um, man, what are you working on now? What's, what do you have in the, what do you have in the pipeline? What's, what's coming down that you can, that you can talk about? Yeah. Well, I have, um, I mean, I, I have two pitches in the pipeline, um, meaning two editorial things that are with editors to decide if they want them or not. If, if I, if those move forward, um, they'd be both really big, big writing projects. So fingers crossed there. Probably shouldn't okay. say about much what they are. One of them I will say is generally about kind of the manosphere, which is a sort of subculture of the internet that, um, you know, has, is a very intense place in terms of the ideas that they have about men and masculinity. Mm -hmm. Um, I just actually wrote, um, um, another forthcoming mandate this week, uh, that, that I was hoping to publish today, but, um, couldn't get my act together basically. Uh, but that's, that's kind of about, my it's related to the praise goblin idea in the sense that it deals with a kind of a version of myself that sometimes shows up and grabs control of my decisions and my perceptions but a lot of it related to my kind of inner child and the uh my inner child needing attention in ways that isn't helpful to me or anyone around me um yeah so i'm going to publish that on monday um and then besides that, you know, it's just the constant drumbeat of working on different uh, editorial ideas. I'm developing a few things and um, hoping at some point in time in the near future where that's defined very loosely. Um, but I would love to publish, you know, a collection of essays as a in book form, but many, many milestones to reach before uh, before I get there. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Love it. What, what are you, uh, what are you putting in your head? What are you reading, listening to? Do you, do you do podcasts or, uh, anything like I that? I do what do podcasts. In? Yeah. Um, I'm reading, I have a lot of different books going, um, some really good ones. I'm rereading, uh, a book called home is burning, um, uh, by Dan Marshall. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a really funny book about a very heavy topic. He, um, it's a memoir about him and his family when, uh, you know, going through the experience of his dad being diagnosed with ALS and then eventually hmm. dying of ALS, but it's like laugh out loud funny. So it's super profane. It's like a really, yeah. it's the creative tension in the book is really, really great. Um, I'm reading a book of essays called all uh, the fun parts or all the fun parts by um, a fiction writer named Sam uh, Lipsight. I think his last name hmm. is just kind of a little bit of a zany fiction writer um, that I really like. Um, I'm reading a book of comics by Leanna Fink. I think her last name is she's has a lot of, she does a lot of comics for like the New Yorker and um, she has a very kind of like rough uh, style, which is super perceptive, interesting things. And then a podcast that I'm listening to, uh, I'm listening to the most recent, season of the big hit show which um dives into fight club hmm. uh, like looking back at fight club and one just how it all came together because it was a very kind of like tumultuous project you know to get greenlit in the first place yeah uh, and but also how the the sort of like the ideas in fight club became inspiration for a lot of sort of men's groups around ideas around masculinity, but also like white nationalists and, um, you know, how it became this sort of like weird calling card for, um, yeah, some of the, yeah, some of the stuff that they're into, which is, you know, the kind of the, the kind of misappropriation of fight club in that realm. 
Yeah, Chuck Palahniuk is an interesting character, Portlander, yeah. and like his his style always strikes me as very very Portland, um, especially on his books. Yeah, outside of Fight Club, he's got some really really interesting ones, um, and and I think he's he's made peace a little bit with about <clears throat> Fight Club is just like a really interesting tip of the iceberg of his his style, and especially the film adaptation is even like a smaller sub sub segment of that but mm -hmm. um yeah it's really interesting to unpack that and almost how that created an interesting narrative narrative trajectory um yeah for the for masculinity and the male movement in that in that era because what was that like when did that come out was that like early early 90s? 99 i think okay so that was right the end of the decade um yeah I, I read earlier this year uh, Chuck Klosterman's book on the '90s. Which yes, I've been meaning to. Oh, so good. I hadn't. That was the first um, I've been meaning to read one of his, and that was a really good place to start. Um, especially, you know, coming of age. You know, I was in middle school and high school. Graduated in '99, so that was like a very culturally like a very coming of age time. So to look back now, 20 years on from the end, you know, into that decade. He just says he just says Klosterman does such a good job of just deconstructing, you know, all the different, you know, both politics, music, culture, um, film. And yeah, he mentions, you know, Fight Club and just that moment, that decade in cinema was very unique uh, in a lot of ways. And just the the rest self-referential, um, you know, it was like the cinephiles decade you know you look at what mm -hmm. yeah what he was making what tarantino was making um yeah it's just really wild huh yeah yeah I, I really want to read the 90s i've read um at least a few of his other books uh i read x which is a collection of essays much like the 90s um on very on because he's done a lot of sports writing as well he's a culture writer but he's written a lot about sports mm -hmm. um and then Sex, Drugs, and po Cocoa Puffs, which is like such a classic. And then he has this book of, sh of short short fiction, um, which is kind of like, it's actually fictional nonfiction, <laughs> where he takes like real stories and then kind of like writes them as fiction. Huh. Um, but he's just such a, he's a, I mean, one, I don't, I don't knowing, I don't understand how, how he can be so prolific. He's written so many things. And it's like just knowing what goes into writing one published article it takes yeah. me, I'm sure he's a lot faster. He's been doing it a lot longer, but it takes me like a few months to write like an editorial piece. And I don't know how many he's written. He's probably written 250 or more, which is insane to me, but he has a really unique voice. Um, really, really unique. I, I've been really enjoying uh, George Saunders' Substack. I think it was you who mentioned that um, yes. in one of your newsletters. I'm like, he's like, you look at someone who really knows and appreciates the craft of writing, and just, I, I could never <laughs> write to that level, but I appreciate being able to, like to peer inside his brain, you know, as he looks at formulating plot, character structure, and just you know, and you know, unpacking, you know why classic works work so well and what they what they reveal it's just so it's like a master class so i mean this guy's like one of the greatest living fiction story you know short story writers if not mm -hmm. the most you know the greatest living short story writer and he's like here have all the things that i just taught to like mfa students for the last 20 years like oh you know like have it for free pay if you want like it's such a we're in such a I think Substack in a way we really benefit because of like so many people still trying to figure out how to do this kind of like content and value exchange in a new age. And I think a lot of, a yeah. lot more stuff is being given away for free than ever yeah. before. And so we kind of stand to benefit from that. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's probably one of the best examples. It's, he's just yeah. like such a luminary. Oh yeah. Just, just brilliant, brilliant. Um, yeah. And then Adam, Adam Tooze's sub stack is really pretty solid too. Just, uh, for someone to, to have like a really good take on the global economy, um, and just sort of the different things in play right now. Um, he has such a good job of zooming out to the macro view and showing, you know, how the modern world events are just interwoven in this really interesting dynamic. Um, 
listening to his book, uh, Crashed, right now, that basically takes like the last 20 years, you know, leading up to the financial crisis of 08, and then, you know, the European debt crisis that followed a couple of years after that, and just all the things that are were in play to set that up. Um, and then just how, how close we became to like global financial apocalypse. It's just like mind blowing. Like, wow, we've yeah, lived, yeah. we've lived through a lot in the last, you know, 20 years. This, this is, uh, this is something. Yeah. yeah. That's wild. I'll have to, I, I wasn't, uh, the book sounds familiar to me, but I wasn't aware of the sub stack. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I can't remember how I heard about it, but, uh, yeah, no, it's good stuff. Got to be careful with the Substack subscriptions because you know it gets gets to be a lot really quickly. <laughs> It'll get pricey. Yeah, I yeah, I'm still just sampling a lot, but yeah, there's there's a lot of really good good content out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There is, there is, yes, man. Cool, cool. Mm. What do you have to do this weekend? Well, um. It, it depends a little bit. I, I I may or may not actually have COVID at the moment. My I've been testing uh, last night and this morning, and I'm getting the really, really faint line on the tests. Mm -hmm. So uh, I may have to sort of bat play down hatches, and I may have to play it safe. So probably not very much fun stuff, unfortunately. I feel great, by the way, I'm, you know, which is awesome, but uh, slightly annoying you know, to have to potentially quarantine for the next week or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. It's like a repeat of like going back to 2021. Like thought we were done with this. I, we will never be done with this. Unfortunately. <laughs> what about you? Um, man, we're prepping to go out of town. We're, we're going to go up to a cabin, um, next weekend with a couple friends. So probably just getting things in order, figuring, figuring some stuff out. There's a lake up, um, kind of on the, on the way to the Eastern side of the state. So it's, it's camping light. So, you know, cabins with small, small kitchenettes. I think there's like a little mini, you know, like a light resort out there there's a restaurant so probably just getting stuff in order the weather's supposed to be pretty decent um so yeah nothing too crazy probably get out you know enjoy some time outdoors with the kids decompress from the week um nothing nothing too crazy yeah nice yeah nice well enjoy the great outdoors hopefully it's not too hot yeah we kind of got through it next weekend is it's supposed to crank back up but yeah we we have a little bit of a respite here where, you know, the clouds are, our, our summers here in Oregon are pretty nice. You know, they're not apart from last summer when we had that heat dome and it hit like 115, 116, that was definitely out of the norm for, for what we usually get. Yeah. 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 Well, it's hot here. It's not anywhere near as hot as it is in New York or Europe, you know, right yeah. now, which is yeah. you know, a relief, but um, I have to get to the ocean soon. <laughs> any asks or anything you want to let's see i'll put let's see your mandate there you go mandate letter dot stack.com honestly that's that is the best place to keep up with um what you know what, I, what i'm up to it's yeah it's where i write original content share all the things i'm interested in reading and you know consuming in general and then often yeah. you know when i've written a big editorial piece i'll i'll share it there as well so um yeah. that's the spot so nice. head over there and um sign up it's free and um yeah i hope to see you there cool cool yeah you start we're gonna do another uh, episode of the the book club here pretty soon we are we are i think i'm gonna switch things up and how we do it but um i guess uh, some more we, we decided media club right it was sort of a little more accessible exactly it's sort of media like because i think i mean I, books are great but i don't expect everyone to go on the journey of you know, book reading that I necessarily go to because I have some very weird niche interests. But um, I think media is something we can all consume or, you know, maybe I'll do, a, you know, I've been thinking about doing it around some of the articles that I've written where there's bits that I haven't been able to include or there's media mm -hmm. associated with it, you know, sort of a post, a post article chat club or something like that. But yeah, um, yeah until the next one. <laughs> I always, I always appreciate the stuff you surface. It's really, yeah, interesting. And you're, you always keep, keep your ear to the ground, which I appreciate in the, in the uh, space. Yeah. Well, I appreciate yeah. you being the OG, you know, the OG uh, book club member and um, 
Green. There's a couple of us, I think, who've stuck around for uh, the, the five are. or six that we've, we've done. It's, it's appreciated. It's very yeah. appreciated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for sitting down before for the weekend, Jason. Appreciate it, and uh, yeah, hope you just have a good time. I hope you know you test, continue to test clear. If you know, drink your fluids, rest up, and yeah, wh whichever way, <laughs> always a good idea to stay hydrated. So, yeah, indeed. Well, thank you for organizing. Always fun to chat. Let me know, and um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.